Hello and welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. We're here for another jam-packed, action-filled information overload. And we are here on the 22nd of February. Does anybody know what the significance of this day is? It's uh, George Washington's birthday. Except uh, for some reason we have uh, a weird, funky thing going up on the screen as... Um, I don't know what my producer is doing. There we go. Um, okay, good to have you back. Uh, I hope you say the same. Good to have me back. Anyhow, um, ah, okay. He was just changing the date to today, the 22nd of February of 2019. There we go. Now we're all, I think, all on the same page. Anyhow, uh, as I was just saying, that today is George Washington's birthday. And if he were alive today, he would be. 287 years old. Yes, George Washington, the father of our country. Now, since it seems that the one thing that's missing in society today is a connection with our history, especially our political history, we're going to take a closer look at George Washington. And we're going to start off with our Prager University segment today titled, What Made George Washington Great? It's hard to imagine there would have been a United States of America without George Washington. He was there at the birth of the nation. He successfully guided it through war and nurtured it in peace. How did he do it? Not by being a great general, a potent political theorist, or even a clever politician. He was none of those things. And yet he was admired by generals, political theorists, and politicians. Why? because he was a man great men trusted. Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, James Madison, and so many others looked up to him, literally. He was one of the tallest men of his era at six feet three. Add courage, integrity, and wisdom, and you have a truly impressive figure. Let's start with his courage. That was never in doubt. If anything, he had too much of it. Bold to the point of rashness as a young man, he fought for the British against the French over control of the Ohio Valley, then the westernmost point of the American wilderness. Throughout that conflict, known as the French and Indian War and the American Revolution, Washington was always in the thick of the action. His aides often struggled to keep him from surging too far ahead of his own troops. In one battle, his coat was pierced four times by musket fire. Horses were shot out from under him. Amazingly, some would say miraculously, he was never wounded, not so much as a flesh wound. By the time the revolution broke out in April of 1775, Washington was firmly committed to the cause of American independence. He arrived in Philadelphia in May of that year to offer his services to the Continental Congress. He was quickly made commander of the new rebel army. There was only one problem. There was no army to speak of. It was just a ragtag collection of state militias. How was Washington going to defeat the greatest military force in the world with that? It was a problem the general struggled with for eight and a half years. That he managed to hold the army together, organize it into a disciplined fighting force, and guide it to victory was testament to his fortitude, his patience, and his personal bravery. Of his integrity, one need only look at what he did when the war ended, exactly what he had promised to do when the war began. He resigned his military command and went home to Mount Vernon. By stepping down, Washington raised himself up as the embodiment of Republican heroism. It is said that King George III asked the London-based American painter, Benjamin West, what Washington was likely to do when peace came. West replied that Washington would probably return to his farm. The king was astounded. If he does that, his majesty declared, he will be the greatest man in the world. This story may be apocryphal, but the Newburgh Rebellion and how Washington handled it is not. With experience had come wisdom. As the revolution wound down, a group of officers refused to give up their arms until they were paid. If they didn't get their money, which Congress didn't have, they would take control of the government. It was not an idle threat. 
no less a figure that Alexander Hamilton was in a panic. Washington, no great orator, sought to diffuse their anger. They had risked everything to create a Republican society, he told the officers. To abandon the cause now, when true victory was so close, would mean all their sacrifices would have been in vain. However convincing the speech may have been, it was a simple gesture that carried the day. He concluded his remarks by reading to them a letter sent to him from a member of Congress. Suddenly he stopped. From his pocket he pulled a pair of spectacles. None of the officers had ever seen him wear them. Putting the glasses on, Washington said, Gentlemen, you must pardon me. I have grown gray in the service of my country and now find myself going blind. He finished reading the letter and left the hall without another word. The gesture, sincerely offered with just the right touch of stagecraft, pierced the hearts of his men. Many were moved to tears. They immediately passed a resolution declaring their loyalty to civilian government. George Washington had saved the revolution once again. It wouldn't be the last time. During the writing of the Constitution and during his eight years as president, Washington was repeatedly called upon to hold the fractious young nation together. He never failed to do so. We commonly refer to George Washington now as the father of our country. It's hard to imagine any nation ever had a better one. I'm John Rothamel, author of George Washington, The Wonder of the Age for Prager University. And that, my friends, is a little bit more as to why we celebrate George Washington's birthday. But now there is actually a deeper question. When is George Washington's real birthday? Is it the 22nd of February or is it something else? Because there was a calendar change that was going on at that time. So let's, ta let's find out. We got the answer right here. George Washington was born on February 22nd, 1732. Or was he? The Julian calendar was introduced by Julius Caesar in 46 BC. For a long time, this was the predominant format used throughout the world, including British colonies of the early 18th century. So according to the Julian calendar, George Washington was actually born on February 11th, 1731, one year and 11 days earlier than what we celebrate today. But Caesar's calendar had issues. It did not accurately reflect the actual time it takes for the Earth to circle once around the sun, otherwise known as a tropical year. So in 1582, Pope Gregory comes up with a better solution, the Gregorian calendar. With its advanced formula for calculating leap years, the Gregorian calendar replaces the old and less accurate Julian calendar. It would take a long time for Pope Gregory's calendar to catch on with the rest of the world. 200 years would pass before Europe and its colonies adopted the new calendar system that we still use today. So, when Great Britain finally adopted the new Gregorian calendar system in 1752, it meant that Washington's birthday was shifted 376 days forward to February 22, 1732. Because we still use the Gregorian calendar today, we celebrate Washington's birthday on February 22nd, right? Actually, that's still not quite the full story. In 1879, under President Rutherford B. Hayes, a federal holiday was created by Congress to commemorate the birth of the father of our country. George Washington's birthday was celebrated by federal workers in the district on February 22nd, until President Richard Nixon came up with a better idea. In 1971, he signed an executive order which moved Washington's birthday to the third Monday of every February. That way, the holiday would never fall on a weekend. But isn't that President's Day? Because the holiday occurs between Washington's birthday on the 22nd and Abraham Lincoln's birthday on the 12th, it is often referred to as President's Day to celebrate both historic figures. But that name is just a colloquialism. Officially and legally, the name of the federal holiday is actually Washington's birthday. So the next time you see a car or mattress commercial for a President's Day weekend sale, remember that you're really celebrating the birth of the father of our country. And don't forget George Washington's actual birthday, February 22nd. So yes, today is the 287th birthday of George Washington. Happy birthday, President Washington. Um, 
I will have to confess that I've only been to Mount Vernon, which is President Washington's home, once. I was so young I don't remember it. My father was uh, stationed at 8th and I Marine Barracks. My mother was a secretary at FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C. Uh, at the time that uh, they, at the, the time they met, they got married, they had me, we left Washington, and I grew up away from Washington, D.C., even though I was born there. And Mom and Dad both told me over the years that you used to, we used to take you to Mount Vernon all the time. I don't remember it. I've actually tried when I was stationed in that area, when I was in the Air Force, I tried to get to Mount Vernon, I think, three different times. A friend of mine is one of their photographers. He photographs Mount Vernon all the time. Uh, Buddy Secor for uh, Ninja Picks. He's a great guy. He's an awesome photographer. And I'm really so happy that he, he got that gig. He's, you know, he's really, really well deserving of the honor of photographing that place. But I've never been there at all that I can remember. But hearing the stories when I was a kid was part of what made me a historian. Because we used to go to Mount Vernon. We used to go to 8th and I Marine Barracks and see the uh, Marine Corps Silent Joel platoon. My parents used to take me to these places before I was old enough to remember them. So then as I was growing up, I'd hear the stories and then I'd actually have to see the places that I've been and didn't remember. And that is what really helped foster a fascination with history, which is one of the reasons why, if you're a longtime viewer of the show, that we often have historical-based programs because uh, we, we really can't afford to lose our history. There are too many people who go through society today with blinders on because they either are not interested in history or it's never been presented to them properly or they just don't know. And, you know, I can't necessarily fault people for that because there's a lot of things in this world that I don't know. Um, even though my producer disagrees with me sometimes. Um, but the fact is, Washington is a very, very important foundation for our country. And I will wade in briefly here that there is a small debate as to whether or not he was the first president of the United States. And I will answer that categorically, yes. And here's why. There were six or seven men who were presidents of the Congress that was the seven-year period we were under the Articles of Incorporation. Or, excuse me, Ar Articles of Confederation. I've been spending so much time in business. Got the wrong term there. The fact is, they were not presidents of the United States because we were loosely confederated as states. That's why we had Articles of Confederation. But being a president of the Congress is not the same as being the president of the United States because the office of the president of the United States was established in the United States Constitution. So therefore, if you're the President of the Congress, you're the President of the Congress. You were not the President of the United States because that office did not exist prior to 1787. So during the first presidential campaign, people looked at George Washington and he was the unanimous choice. George Washington was a Federalist, even though he is often said to be nonpartisan because he did not officially choose a political party. He was very closely aligned with the Federalist Party, which was established by his friend, very close friend, uh, almost uh, Alexander Hamilton, the Secretary of the Treasury, who was almost like a son to George Washington. So we do know that George Washington did have some party allegiances even though he tried bringing the new young country together, um, trying to get the support of both factions. So we're going to hear a longer discussion here on the importance of George Washington by a, probably one of the most foreknown, foreign well-known historians of our modern era, and that's uh, David McCullough. And he really gives you a deeper dive into the person of who George Washington was. So let's take a look at that interview. He wasn't an intellectual. He wasn't a uh, great speaker or a brilliant writer. He wasn't, as a military leader, a 
a brilliant tactician or, or strategist, but he had the capacity to make people want to follow him. And, and if there was a more courageous human being who ever lived, I don't know who it was. And it was the courage of his convictions. And he would not quit. Uh, every, every sign was it was over, you've lost, give up, it's not worth it. But no, he, he wouldn't stop. And he was the same kind of a unifying force when he became president, maybe more so. You know, it, it didn't just come to us out of the sky. It just, these advantages we have, this system of life and government and our freedoms didn't just happen. Somebody had to work hard and suffer, and many of them, of course, died to make it happen. And the doubters were all around. It wasn't as if everybody was, oh, this is a wonderful thing, let's, let's go out and fight for it. A fraction of the country was for it. A fraction of the country was willing to serve in the army. I think maybe if there's a message in Washington's life, it's that, it's that willingness to serve and not just talk about what you're going to do, but to act. It takes both. And uh, absolute selfless service to the country in, as they said, war and peace for no pay, nothing in it for him. And then when he gets the ultimate power, as almost nobody could imagine, he gave it up, willingly, of his own choice. And uh, this was after the war was over and he'd won. He was the conquering general. He was the hero. Yeah, he could have been anything he wanted, czar, king, potentate, whatever. He could have made the presidency into a totally different kind of office. But he relinquished power. He said, no, I'm going back to Mount Vernon. And when George III heard that he might, he, George Washington, might do that, he said, if he does that, he will be the greatest man in the world. And uh, because nobody had done that before. This was the, the ultimate uh, uh, ideal of Cincinnatus, you know, that uh, you, the, the conquering general, the conquering hero returns to the plow. Well, when the British arrived in uh, the lower bay uh, of uh, New York, New York Harbor, and when they came up into the bay with a force of ships, it was the largest single armada ever seen in the 18th century. Largest armada ever sent forth to suppress a, another people in another part of the world in, in all of history up until then. There had never been anything like it, and, it, and they landed 30, 2,000 troops on Staten Island, which was more than the entire population of the largest city in the colonies, which was Philadelphia. And when they came ashore at Long Island, they defeated our army. The largest battle of the, of the Revolutionary War was fought on Long Island, and it was a disaster. And the retreat that followed uh, was uh, brilliant. Uh, they escaped at night from uh, Long Island, from Brooklyn Heights, which was sort of the Dunkirk of the Revolution. Um, a masterful uh, demonstration of leadership on Washington's part because an orderly retreat, even for an experienced army, is the most difficult maneuver to make. And to make it with an inexperienced army at night across the East River, which isn't a river at all but a tidal estuary, uh, was almost uh, beyond imagining. And, and again, the British woke up the next day, as they had in Boston, to discover the guns on Dorchester Heights to discover that this army they were chasing had vanished. Now, that's, it was brilliant and it was masterful, but you don't win wars by retreating, and that's all they did for the rest of that year was, uh, was retreat. And the army kept getting smaller and smaller by the time uh, they were down in New Jersey, getting close to the Delaware River. Uh, the the uh, size of Washington's army was only about 5,000, and probably only 3,000 of those men were fit for duty. And here, here comes the British uh, juggernaut uh, with, uh, you know, 25, 30,000 men if they needed it. And uh, that was the time that, as uh, Thomas Paine said, that tried men's souls. And uh, Washington managed to get across the river, and then he took stock, and people were saying, look, it's over, and we've lost. But he refused to see it that way, and so what he did, what is often what one has to do when all hope's gone, he attacked. 
and he, that's when he crossed the Delaware Christmas night and struck at Trenton and won, and then a few days later turned around and struck at Princeton and won. Now those weren't big battles, they were engagements, but the fact that he'd won, the fact that they had defeated this foe was of immense importance to morale all through the country, and that really was not just a turning point in the revolution or in our history, it was a turning point in world history because it wasn't gonna be the same again after that. And that was force of, force of character, force of something inside that man and those people around him, Nathaniel Green and Henry Knox, John Glover and others like that, and the men in the ranks um, who were few and they had no clo adequate clothing and then some of them had no shoes and men died, men froze to death that night on the march to Trenton, just dropped dead from, from exposure in the army, in the, on the march. And, uh, and he held it together. It's, it's amazing. And here was a man who too few people understand, uh, loved interior decoration loved uh, architecture, loved landscape design, was an avid uh, uh, agriculturalist, as they called it then, who, uh, who was fastidious about his clothing, his appearance. He had all kinds of human traits that are extremely interesting and revealing. Um, everybody says he was a fox hunter. Well, what kind of a fox hunter was he? He was the kind of fox hunter that was out there at the front, as close to the hounds as you could get, very dangerous place to be, and who would not give up. He would fox hunt for seven, eight hours until they'd got the fox. He just was that kind of a person, tenacious. Well, you know, if you're gonna be in a fight, that's a good kind of leader to have. And of course, we have always, as I suppose every nation and people have in all time. We admire that kind of leadership and courage, and particularly if it's in a cause that's just, and a cause that's far beyond his own self-aggrandizement or enrichment of any kind. Well, he was the leader. He was the commander-in-chief. He was the uh, the, the winning general, in the simplest terms, he won. Took a lot of good luck and help of the French, and it took a long time, the longest war in our history except for Vietnam. And then once we had won, he became the stabilizing factor in the divisiveness that immediately emerged between the regions, particularly North and South. And, uh, and he held the country together for eight years as president. And they, this isn't something that later day scholars have, uh, have imposed on the, on the material from the past. This is in what they were saying then. He is what's holding us together. He was the, the force of unity. And at that stage, we needed that desperately because there were all kinds of forces outside and inside that were trying to break it up. Europe would have loved to have seen us break up. The faster, the better. One of the lessons of any great creative effort is that it takes all kinds of people to make it happen. And it took all kinds of people to make the miracle of the creation of the United States of America happen. And they weren't the same. They brought different qualities, different abilities, different talent. What Washington brought was the, was the gift of leadership, the gift of courage, leadership, character, conviction willpower. We will make it happen. And there's no limit to what can be accomplished with goodwill and hard work. And that's a tonic, you know, that's a powerful message, particularly for a people that are struggling just to, to, make, a, to, to make a start. He wasn't always successful. There's an idea that we have, I suppose that it comes from people who are born athletes or born musical uh, uh, virtuosos or whatever, that he had to work hard to become George Washington. It wasn't easy. He suffered defeat, he made mistakes, he made blunders. Um, 
he was frustrated in his ambitions uh, again and again as a young man. He had a lot to learn. Uh, he had to, uh, he, he had to uh, get, go to the wilderness, which he did. I mean, that's something people don't understand. If you, you talk about someone getting into outward bound, let's say. This was the most outward bound young man in uh, Virginia uh, in his day when it was real wilderness and real uh, adversity uh, living uh, uh, with, on the land or in the wilderness. And his, um, his resilience, physical, more mental, uh, spiritual, this guy could really take it. And, uh, and yes, he does sometimes resort to self-pity in his letters, and yes, he can at times not tell the entire truth, and yes, he uh, uh, can let people down, and he's a human being. Thank goodness, thank goodness. Look, if they were gods, they wouldn't deserve much credit, would they? Because gods can do whatever they want. These are human beings who did what they did. That's what makes it a story, and that's what makes it an encouraging story, an inspirational story, if I may use that word. I don't believe much in ranking presidents. I, 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 are you ranking them as a human being? Are you ranking them as a politician? Are you ranking them in, uh, in view of what they accomplished? There's so many criteria, so many measurements. But Washington was our greatest president. He was the one at the start. He held it together and he set the example. He, he was the defining model of what the president should be and do. We could not have been more fortunate. I mean, you talk about good luck, good heavens, what he could have been, what he could have done that would have been so detrimental, so um, disruptive. And uh, now, Lincoln's great gift was a gift of soul, a depth of soul, and, and once again, he held the country together and fought a war uh, successfully to free people from bondage. And, uh, uh, but uh, Washington is there at the beginning. And the, and the Revolutionary War is the most important war in our history because that's how we came to be. Well, that's, of course, a very subjective question. It's personal. I think what, he's, what he reminds us is that public service, service to the country, the, willing to, the willingness to serve is what makes it work. And nobody served longer at greater personal sacrifice uh, with less monetary material reward than George Washington. Selfless devotion to the cause of the country. And I think that's a lesson that can't be stressed too often or too much. He held the country together, held the cause together, and did so um, in a way that sets an example for behavior as a citizen that we can all learn from and that his picture really should be, along with Abraham Lincoln, back in every schoolroom as it used to be. And uh, this isn't ancestor worship or this isn't uh, uh, old fashioned um, history, this is the this is reality, this is the truth. And uh, to be indifferent to people like Washington, to be uninterested in people like Washington is really a form, in part, of ingratitude. We ought to be down on our knees every day thanking God that we are part of this country. And we ought to know about the people who made it possible and thank them, in effect, by showing interest in them. And, uh, and their world, their time. I can't overemphasize that. The 18th century is one of the most interesting periods in all of human history. And it's full of tumult and change, 
just as ours is. And one, mother, one other thing, I think any time we get down and we think, oh, we're living in such a dangerous, uh, difficult, uncertain time, oh, woe is us, uh, excuse me, it's, we've been through far worse than we're going through now, uh, with far greater adversity, far more imminent danger, imminent danger, uh, we, have, um, we have suffered more. We have known uh, darker clouds on the horizon by far than we do now. And we've come through it. And we will again. And let's draw from that example. Draw strength from, strength from history. History is a source of strength and should be. And Washington, of course, individually as a human being, as a, as a figure in history, is one of the protagonists of our story, is a, is a, is a particularly... Uh, um, striking example of history as a source of strength. So I hope you gleaned a few more insights into the life of our first president, George Washington. Now, as David McCullough still believes that he is the greatest uh, president that we've ever had, a survey that came out in November of last year over half of young Americans, specifically those in Generation Z, ages 14 to 21, believe former President Barack Obama had a bigger impact on the United States than George Washington, according to a new survey on American patriotism. Uh, while the numbers show that Americans across all age ranges, 14 to 73 plus, believe Washington had a greater impact on the U.S. than Obama, 61% to 39%, over half of those in the Generation Z age ranges, believe the opposite. That was among many eyebrow-raising eyebrow findings from well-known polling firm YouGov, which conducted the survey of 1,078 Americans for the Foundation for Liberty and American Greatness. What else did the report find? One in five millennials say the American flag is a sign of intolerance and hatred. The majority of those in younger generations agree that America is racist and sexist. And 46% of millennials agree that America is more racist than other countries. 46% of millennials don't agree that America is the greatest country in the world. One in eight millennials, 14%, agree that America was never a great country and it ne will never be. 38% of younger Americans disagree that America has a history that we should be proud of. Over 60% of Americans in the ages 14 to 37 age range approve of athletes kneeling for the national anthem. Only one in six Americans across all age ranges can pass a quiz on basic American history. One in six can pass a quiz? One in six? I wonder why all of these other numbers are so skewed when one in six can't even pass a basic quiz on American history. I would bet that of those people who answered that Barack Obama had a bigger impact on the United States than George Washington, probably never even heard of George Washington. Seriously, if, they, if one in six American, uh, Americans across all age ranges can pass a quiz on basic American history, something is wrong and it's called our education system. But believe it or not, those in Gen Z are more likely to know how many amendments are in the Bill of Rights and when the Constitution was ratified than older Americans. There's a little bit of hope. A little bit of hope. Hope and change. Hope and change. And my Lord, I really hope that this changes, that we can get that from, you know, well, I'm um, uh, one divided by six, just so I make sure it's right. 16.67% of our country can pass a basic history quiz. 167 That's a good question. Our producer said, I wonder how easy the, the test was. It's a, I, I really wish I knew what those quizzes were like. Now, I know I would ace them because I'm a historian. I mean, I've gone through so much in my bachelor's in history uh, and master's in history programs that basic stuff for me is a no-brainer. But I don't expect everybody to perform at the advanced levels, but can't they at least get the basics down? 16.67? 
I am flabbergasted. Now, this is the first time I'm reading the story. I actually, during the uh, playing of that interview, I was just looking up uh, some George Washington stuff, and I came across this uh, November 27th, 2018 article in theblaze.com. And I am just amazed at what I just read. And just so you know, I didn't just take a look at what the Blaze had to say. I actually looked up the link to the actual survey, and the survey echoed the statistics that they had in the story. 16.67%. See, there is a reason why we teach history on North Star Oasis. Because I really hope that you can pass a basic history test. I hope that from a program like today, when we're discussing George Washington and we bring on interviews with historians who have far more credibility than I do, that you take a chance to listen and open up your mind just enough to learn a little bit about them. Now, we're going to get back to George Washington. And to Dallas, play these two clips back to back because really it's, it's related on the same thing. When George Washington left office, he gave a farewell address to the nation. Now, if we were to play the entire farewell address, we wouldn't have enough time left in the show. It's like 37 minutes if, of narration. We're not playing 37 minutes of George Washington's farewell address. But we do have two small segments that we're going to play about his warning. Because inside his address, he did give us a warning, and that should still stick with us today. So let's play these next two back to back. We have a vision of Washington today that's very distant. He seems almost sort of a figure off Mount Olympus, if not Mount Rushmore. And we think of him as being above the partisan fray, and as a result, he's lost a bit of his humanity. He was a very self-monitoring man. He understood um, very clearly the discipline of dignity, um, which is how he saw leadership being a general. But um, the behind the mask of command that he very carefully cultivated, that in, particularly during his second term, that this was a man in pain, psychic pain, physical pain. He was becoming brittle and ill-tempered. He would go into furious rages, largely about the forces of partisanship that he could feel exploding even within his own cabinet. You know, here was a man with no sons, but his two most talented cabinet members, two surrogate sons, Jefferson and Hamilton, were warring with each other even within his own cabinet. And here Washington was trying to reconcile their divisions very actively. There was every indication that America might devolve into a civil war, that we could go the way other republics had in the past, of being divided um, and our own worst enemy. And that's what Washington, based on his understanding of history, actively was trying to correct with the farewell address. So here was a man in full, and he brought all the aspects of his life into this speech. It was the sum total of all his hard one wisdom. This was a document that people understood had a kind of transcendent value. It alone, I think, has the ambition among the founding documents um, to bridge the past with the present, with the future. And that also makes it unique. George Washington warned us about turning a blind eye to violations of the Constitution, no matter how small. A lot of people are happy to support the Constitution when it fits their own political goals, but they just as quickly ignore it when it doesn't. On the left, people often tell us that the founders couldn't have understood firearms today and never would have made the Second Amendment apply to anything more than muskets, or the National Guard. On the right, we hear that the founders would have made exceptions to the requirement for Congress to declare war because of terrorism. So both sides are happy to ignore the Constitution when they feel it's necessary. But in his farewell address, George Washington warned us about this kind of usurpation. He said if the people have a problem with the distribution or modification of constitutional powers, they should correct it through the amendment process. Washington went on to say the precedent set by ignoring the Constitution or changing it through an act of Congress or a judicial edict must always greatly overbalance in permanent evil any partial or transient benefit which the use can at any time yield. In other words, 
there might be a short-term benefit from letting the feds take on issues without constitutional authority, but the precedent you set by allowing the feds to usurp power is eventually going to bite you. As Washington put it, a just estimate of that love of power and proneness to abuse it, which predominates in the human heart, is sufficient to satisfy us of the truth of this position. Here's a question. Why do we learn history? Why is all of that important? And really, the basic answer is it's important because once we understand what happened before, we can actually take a look at where we're at now and where we need to be in the future. You know, in investing, we always hear, especially if you listen to the radio uh, or TV ads about investing, the phrase, past performance is not indicative of future results. But sometimes, when you look back throughout history, past performance is indicative of future results. As the old cliche that Albert I attributed to Albert Einstein is that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing all over and over again, expecting different results. Kind of like Bernie Sanders continuing to push for socialism when every time we turn around we know that it fails. Granted, that's a topic for another discussion for another day, but if we don't look at our history, we're going to make the mistakes of the past. George Santayana uh, had the uh, famous quote, um, now I had it in, the, in my brain, now it just escaped me. Um, well, never mind, I'll, I'll think about it later. Uh, the fact is, um, we need to learn this stuff because we've got a great country that we live in, a great part of the world, but we can do better. We can do better than where, we, where we've been, but we can't and won't do better than we were if we don't understand where we were. How can we say we want a better future if we don't know what we had in the past? Was it any better or any worse? And this goes back to Donald Trump's campaign slogan, Make America Great Again. That's, of course, the assumption that America was great in the first place, which this recent survey that I pointed out now, we're not sure if it was even great to begin with. Well, actually, do they know their history? Oh, one in six people don't know their history. Can't even pass a basic quiz. See, therein lies the problem. Five and six don't know. Five and six don't know. Thank you. Only one in six can, uh, have passed the test. Five and six do not know. So that's why we need to go through history. So now, in this program, we're at a transition point because we've looked at the first president of the United States, now we're going to look at a candidate who hopes that she will be the next president of the United States. She hopes that she'll be number 46. And I'm talking about Minnesota's own Amy Klobuchar. Now, we didn't get a chance to cover this at all last week. So for the remainder of our program, we're going to play some snippets from her uh, presidential announcement starting now. Where are we? Blue now, we don't let a little snow stop us. No. We don't let a little cold stop us. No. Like, are you guys even cold? No. Uh, tell the truth. No. Okay. <laughs> now, when I said that elected leaders should go not just where it's comfortable, but also where it's uncomfortable. This is what I meant. Now, John and I want to first thank our amazing and incredible team and staff for putting this together. Unbelievable. Also, the city of Minneapolis Parks, thank you. All the incredible people that turned out. My friends, Tina Smith, and Governor Walls, Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan, highest ranking Native American state official in our nation. 
our congressional delegation. Thank you. Mayors, commissioners, legislators. Oh, I forgot. My dad, who's 90 years old. And you always want to thank your in-laws. Bill and Marilyn from Mankato. Thank you, Dudley D., who traveled with Prince for so many years for being here. Moving hey, forward. If Prince could do that half. Okay, so now Amy Klobuchar is going to spend the next, like, four or five minutes thanking everybody. I don't think you really want to sit through uh, Amy thanking a whole bunch of people, some of whom you may know, some of whom you may not know. Uh, but I can, when I first heard this, when she was doing it live, I was thinking, when she said, where are we, Boom Island? I'm thinking some New Yorker sitting there watching this on C-SPAN on his television set say, Boom Island, where the, is Boom Island? Like, who cares? Um, it, it, that's just something that jumped out at me. Nobody in this country outside of people in perhaps Minneapolis really know where Boom Island is. But Amy's a Minnesotan, true and true. So that's the uh, crowd that was out there. So now we're going to move up to minute seven. This is like a 24-minute uh, piece, and we're not going to give you 24 minutes. So we're going to take a look at the next clip. On the Iron Range. He never graduated from high school. He saved money in a coffee can in the basement to send my dad to college. My dad, who's here at age 90, got a two-year degree from Vermilion Junior College and then finished up at the great University of Minnesota. He became, he became a journalist. As a young, thank you, person cheering. As a young Associated Press reporter, he called the 1960 presidential race for John F. Kennedy. He covered the 1968 conventions. He interviewed everyone from Mike Ditka to Hubert Humphrey, to Ronald Reagan, to Ginger Rogers. Freedom of the press wasn't some abstract idea to my dad. He embraced it. He lived it. My mom, a proud union member, taught, taught second grade in the suburbs until she was 70 years old. Her students, now grown, still come up to me on the street and tell me she was their favorite teacher. So today, on an island in the middle of the mighty Mississippi, in our nation's heartland. Okay, so I uh, have to say that I have made my decision on who I am going to support in 2020. Uh, based upon what we've seen so far, I am voting for Jim Klobuchar for president uh, at the age of 90. No offense, Amy. But so far in the speech, we've heard more about your father than we have uh, of you. And I've read your father's columns in the Star Tribune for many, many, many years. And so perhaps even at the age of 90, he might be fit for running for president. That's just a little joke, people. Just a joke because here, seven to eight minutes into this, she's still thanking her father. Now, that's not to say that Jim Klobuchar doesn't deserve being thanked. Of course he does. But seven minutes into a, uh, a presidential announcement speech? Okay, where's the meat? Or as they said in the 80s with the Wendy's uh, uh, commercial, where's the beef? Well, let's see if our producers found it yet. Let's take a look at where we're at now. It comes to the digital revolution. Hey guys, it's not just coming, it's here. And if you don't know the difference between a hack and slack, it's time to pull off the digital highway. What would I do? What would I do as president? We need to put some digital rules of the road into law when it comes to people's privacy. For too long, the big tech companies have been telling you, don't worry, we've got your back. While your identities, in fact, are being stolen and your data is being mined, our laws need to be as sophisticated as the people who are breaking them. We must revamp our nation's cybersecurity and guarantee net neutrality for all. 
And we need to end the digital divide by pledging to connect every household to the internet by 2022. And that means you, rural America. I mean, come on. If they can do it in Iceland, we can do it here. We need to train our workers today for the jobs of tomorrow and strengthen our economy by planning ahead. That means respecting and recognizing educational certifications and two-year degrees and making it easier for people to get them. And yes, and yes, that means comprehensive immigration reform. It is time, America. And by the way, we should close those tax loopholes designed by and for the wealthy and bring down our debt and make it easier for workers to afford child care. Okay, I had to pause it there for just a minute. And I'm, I'm going to be all serious here on Senator Klobuchar discussing the pathway to getting a two-year college degree. I got mine out of the way. That was really not that difficult. 83.33% of the American populace cannot pass a basic history test. Only 16.67% of the people can. So if 83.33% of the people cannot pass a history test, should they be given a college degree? I don't think they should really even get a high school diploma, much less a two-year college degree. And I'm not talking about those who want to specialize in history as a career field. This is considered your basic liberal arts education. See, you kind of figured I'd weave my way in there. But Amy Klobuchar gave it right there in her presidential announcement. We need to make it easier to make a pathway for people to get a two-year degree. Well, I think it would be a whole lot easier if we actually went back and, stu and, and taught history so 83.33% of the population that cannot pass a basic history test can pass a basic history test and we can have a 100% history graduation rate. And then you should be able to at least qualify for getting that part of a two-year degree uh, marked off. Uh, obviously, there would still be more with math and science and humanities, uh, but your history, st if, if we get so many people who are not passing a basic test in history, I think then we've got a problem with the entire education system, which should not make it easier for a pathway for a two-year degree. So let's go. We're going to go to the last four minutes of Amy Klobuchar's announcement address. Right but we all live in the same country of shared dreams. In Minnesota, we have the biggest Somali population in the country, and we are proud of that community. A few years ago, at the height of the angry rhetoric, a Somali-American family of four went out to dinner right here in Minnesota. This guy walked by, he looked down at them and said, you four go home. You go home to where you came from. And the little girl looked up at her mom, and she said, Mom, I don't want to go home. You said we could eat out for dinner tonight. I don't want to eat dinner at home. You think of the innocent words of that little girl. She only knows one home, and that's our state. She only knows one home, and that's the United States of America. Walt Whitman, the great American poet, once wrote these words. I hear America singing the varied carols I hear. For Whitman, those were the songs of the mechanics, the carpenters, the masons, the shoemakers. And those carols are still being sung today. They are now all... Um, again, going back in history, and I hate picking apart Senator Klobuchar like this. Uh, I really, I listened to her speech initially, but we're kind of just, you know, we're hitting the play button and going with what she has to say, and uh, she misses the whole meaning of Walt Whitman. Why was he hearing America? He was writing that during the time of the American Civil War when we were ripped apart, when 
Walt Whitman was going up to the Harewood Hospital in Washington, D.C., seeing the results of the battles by attending to the wounded in the hospitals. That's who Walt Whitman had in mind. It wasn't anything about the construction workers and the lumberers and all these people. No, he was seeing people who were dying and dead at the hospitals. He knew a lot of people who had gone off to war. He had seen with his own eyes how this country had torn itself apart, but he also saw how it came back together. That is what Walt Whitman had in mind when he wrote that. I'm going to say it. I would like to see Senator Klobuchar take that basic history course, or the, the history quiz. I'm wondering if she is able to pass it. I, I, I hate to sound so negative here, because she is a sitting U.S. Senator. She is from Minnesota. She is a Minnesota Senator. I have to say that in the context of Washington's birthday and running for president, and then this whole thing about the survey that I discovered during this show, during show, you know, literally after, as the show was going on, I'm flabbergasted. I really, really am. So anyhow, let's go uh, one last uh, small clip. We'll just pick it up where we left off, and then we'll come back and finish it up. Also, the songs of our sisters and brothers, a chorus of different faiths, races, creeds, and ways of life. E pluribus unum. Out of one, out of many, one. It is more than a motto, America. It is the North Star of our democracy. It is the North Star of our effort. I am asking you to join this campaign. It is a homegrown one. I don't know if you can even see our number because of the snow, but you can text Amy at 91990. I don't have a political machine. I don't come from money. But what I do have is this. I have grit. I, I have family. I have friends, I have neighbors, and I have all of you who are willing to come out in the middle of winter. All of you who took the time to watch us today from home. All of you who are willing to stand up and say people matter. I'm asking you. Okay. Good luck. Good luck, Senator Klobuchar. Good luck. In the last minute that we've got, I'm going to say this. This is my prognostication about what's going to happen. Uh, and Amy Klobuchar has been getting some criticism for, because she didn't, is not finishing her, si first, her full six-year term. I don't think she's going to get the nomination. Amy Klobuchar has done a very good job in her Senate career of managing her image to come across as a centrist. A lot of times she's rated the 50th most liberal and the 50th most conservative U.S. senator. She's right there in the middle. Now that might be great in trying to win a general election, but in today's day and age, the people who are going to matter first are your far-left progressives of the Democratic Party who are going to be styled the nomination. And she's got to court the superdelegates. I don't think she's got a chance. And she came out against the Green New Deal. She's not left enough for the left. I don't think she gets the nomination, and we'll have her for five more years as senator. Anyhow, thanks for watching. See you next week.